Hello again. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk about a new measure that we've been developing called the SQL, Supportive Environmental Quality Underlying Adult Learning, and it fits really well with the presentations we've heard this morning because we are really focusing a lot in the field, understandably, on what we want teachers to know and do. And we, um, that's been the focus of our uh, quality improvement efforts, and we haven't spent very much time talking about what teachers need to be able to do that besides professional development and education, which of course are very important, but it's not the only ingredient, and this is part of our No Single Ingredient project. You know, if any of you bake, you know, try baking your cookies and forgetting the sugar, you know, you'll, it's not going to quite come out the way you want. And I think generally um, in the field we have had a lot of lack, we haven't really be, been attending to the work environments. And when you start talking about different kinds of early childhood programs, the work environments in Head Start and Pre-K are very different from what's going on in child care. And even within each sector, they're different you know, among, within the, each group. We actually don't really have very many good measures to look at the work environment. And I think, um, I'll go back, talk about that in a minute. But the other thing I just want to say is I think in a certain way, we've abandoned a little what we know about adult learning as we've approached quality improvement because we're asking people to change what they do and we're asking grown-up people who have, uh, many of them have been doing what they do for a long time. And I'm on the, the older end of the age range in this room, but I suspect all of us are familiar with how hard it is actually to change your habits. And so, we know from adult learning you have to sort of engage, it has to be meaningful to people. I mean, the, the threat of losing your job could be meaningful, but there's probably some more positive things we want people to be um, thinking about as they're engaging in change. And we haven't really talked enough to teachers about what it is that they need. So I think in part of that, and I would just, I don't know if you can see this, but that's a hot potato. And um, I think some of the work that I did with Carol Lee and Deborah years ago and some of the other work that I've done, because wages and turnover came out to be such strong predictors of quality in a lot of the research, I think the field kind of stopped thinking about the work environment. Because if you say, well, we know we have to improve the wages, and I hear that all the time, still, you know, people pull me aside and say, well, nobody's really talking about wages, you know, or turnover or any of these things. We sort of, we didn't think there was enough money, so we just sort of stopped thinking about it all together. So in addition to our center being concerned about this issue about how do adults really go about <coughs> changing what they do, we've been trying to sort of slice the potato up a little bit so that people can take a piece and chew on it and think about what is a, a supportive environment for teachers that allows them to apply what they know and continue to grow on the job. And so that got us to thinking, well, gee, let's talk to some teachers. And so along with Sharon Ryan at Rutgers, I mentioned yet yesterday is working with us, we did a focus group, focus groups around the country with different kinds of programs. And before we did that, we did a lot of review of the literature, um, not just stuff that studies that we had done about uh, the predictors of quality. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, the accreditation research I did a number of years ago, but the programs that actually were able to succeed at getting, becoming accredited and improving their quality had certain things in place. They paid higher wages, they had less turnover, they had a well-educated director who knew early childhood who stayed on the job. You know, there were certain things that people needed to actually really focus on getting better and getting to good and sustaining that. And uh, but even if you look at the K through 12 literature around uh, teacher improvement, a lot of it has things around professional sharing time, you know, different kinds of things that really make a, a difference to teachers in their work. And so we went out and we talked to um, teachers that were in Head Start, Pre-K, and Child Care, and we included both teachers and teaching assistants, and we did a couple focus groups with directors and educational coordinators, too. And we were very concerned about wanting to get to this issue of what we call the spray bottle teachers, you know, the people that are in the classrooms that are actually interacting with the children, but actually are oftentimes not part of the quality improvement efforts. And so, th no, I mean, well, this study's coming out soon, but no big, not really no big surprises, but it was confirming to us when we heard the teachers talking because they were saying, well, professional development is important, 
but it has to be targeted to what we're trying to do in our classrooms and what we need to know. And so, I mean, I do think there is this tension between we really want people to focus on what they're doing with children in terms of content areas, but if someone can't manage the classroom, then we actually have to address that first. They also talked about we learn from each other and we never have time to talk to each other. And for the people who were in Head Start and Pre-K, there was a lot of talk about paperwork and how much time teachers were spending if they actually had planning time doing the paperwork. And the teaching assistants were saying, well, the teachers aren't teaching anymore. We're doing the teaching because teachers are filling out the assessment. So you know, there were issues around time, but really, are we able, able to really talk with each other? They really talked a lot about the director who encourage staff to learn from each other and see each other as a, a support. And you know, people talked a lot about teaching is individual, but it's also collective. And I'm doing this with other people. I'm never in a classroom by myself. And so what we can do has to do with how well we do it together. And then they also talked a lot about infrastructure supports. It's, you know, that, that policies can be in place, but if there aren't the practices behind them, then they actually really aren't functioning as policies. So the one that we heard the most was sick leave. If people even got sick leave, the question was, were there subs? And if there were subs, if you actually used a sub, was everybody mad at you because you stayed out because you had the flu? Or in fact, was there a culture that actually said, yes, you're sick, don't come to work? I mean, that's just one you know, example. So anyway, we went on to develop the sequel. It's been a long process. We did a pilot study in um, San Francisco and 30 centers. And at that point, we had four domains, which I'll talk about more about the domains in a minute. But teaching supports, learning community, job crafting, and adult well-being, which we maintained after we did the analysis, that, you know, our factor analysis and things afterwards. But we had assumed that leadership was embedded in every domain, and leadership came at it as its own domain. So when we redid it, we did, we had five domains. And before I talk about them, I just want to say trying to develop something that works across sectors with using this language that people can understand was maybe the hardest part of developing, developing the instrument. because. If you say center, that doesn't work for someone's in the school-based program. You know, if you say, you know, when teaching staff, who do you mean? And with it, because everybody calls teachers different things and different kinds of programs. And the hardest part was figuring out the supervisory level because in many programs, it isn't the director or the principal who's actually supervising the teacher. And then in some programs, you have someone who's leading the program, but there's actually a central district office or some other thing, other group that's actually making decisions. So that took us an entire summer to figure out talking to many, many people to get it, and we hope we have it right. So anyway, we have these five, uh, five domains. And I'm just going to really quickly, because I know you've been sitting here for a long time. Nobody's had a break. Um, and so the, one of the domains is teaching supports. And we worked with an advisory committee, and they were really helpful in getting us to think through what are the supports that just teachers need to have in place that are about teaching. So it's things like a curriculum and a, an observation and assessment framework. Um, you have to have certain materials in place. But it was also about do teachers have some kind of support so that if they see they have a child in need or a family in need that someone can come help them. And then there were issues around staffing. Are there just enough people in the room um, and who actually know what they're doing? And, um, and is there time for people's key te teaching functions? In terms of... Um, the next domain is learning community. And this was really interesting to think about because it was that's why we wanted to do this issue of sort of individual and collective learning. And people talked a lot about um, going off to a training and coming back and not and trying to tell other people what they've been to and facing resistance or other people weren't engaged in it when people were the happiest and felt like they were making the best changes is when they were actually in the entire program, people were thinking about getting better and learning things. And there was an, uh, an atmosphere that said, you can practice this, you can try this out, you can think about what you're learning. Um, and I would say for some of the people in the public programs, this was particularly true in some of the, um, to my California colleagues, the AB212 programs, these folks were going to so many trainings but they never actually had time to come back and talk to anybody, talk to each other about what they were doing. And then uh, the third domain is job crafting, and that has to do with the program practices and policies in place that actually allow teachers to change what they're doing. We heard lots of teachers come back and say, well, I learned this thing, but I tried to talk about it, and either my fellow teachers said, you know, we're not going to do that. The director said it couldn't do it. And, and in some programs, people really can't make decisions about what they're doing. And that's where you get this tension between 
if the curriculum's too scripted and, you know, sort of where, where does teachers sort of making autonomous decisions, is that, what, where's the balance on that? Um, then the fourth domain is adult well-being, and here we talk, we focus on economic, physical, and sort of emotional well-being. And what I want to say about the economic well-being, before, we did not want to create a measure, like in the, you know, the most, I, it was the last thing I wanted to do at this stage of um, my development. But what we found that all the studies we were doing when we were trying to ask teachers about some of these things and test out different, you know, like items from different measures, different things, is that whenever you put wages into a, uh, anything to look at quality, wages just wipes out everything else. And so we actually realized we had to take wages out. I mean, we collect information about wages, but we took wages and turnover out, but we talked about it. We looked at sort of economic well-being and economic insecurity issues. Um, and I will just say, uh, in doing the pilot and talking to teachers and assistant teachers about the economic insecurity issues, I've never been so happy in my life that we had $20 <coughs> gift cards at Target to hand to people because people were having such a hard time in many, many programs and even in programs that, that they weren't serving just, you know, weren't in poverty neighborhoods. Um, just some things about physical well, well-being and teachers said it wasn't so much about the ergonomic tables and all that, but they did talk about like there's no place for me to put my purse. You know, um, I'm scared when I walk into the building if it's dark still in the morning. Uh, people also talked about things like uh, staff rooms, and actually in one center in San Francisco, the staff room, you know on, on school, you know, school playgrounds there's like a equipment, uh, you know, sort of cupboard where they keep the balls and all that kind of, they had made that the, the preschool classroom uh, staff room. So it was literally a closet that they put a chair in, so, you know what I mean. And then um, the emotional well-being is more things around staff dynamics and issues of equity and fairness and whether or not people feel like they're heard, they can bring, they can talk to their directors, those kinds of things. And then the last one is program leadership. And that was a lot what teacher says is I want the person who's evaluating me to actually know my teaching. I want them to know who the children are in my classroom. So when they're coming in, and I'm not talking about someone doing the class, I'm talking about someone coming in really working with them about their teaching, and it really helps when the, the leader or the person who's um, running the program knows something about early childhood, which seems silly that we have to say that, but in, depending on how programs are organized, that could be the issue. So anyway, what we're doing now. So the, the um, sequel is something that teachers and uh, teaching assistants fill out in a program. Everybody in the program does it. We're doing two validation studies right now with the revised instrument, one in North Carolina in conjunction with their rated licensing program. And we're, um, so all this discussion about points and uh, it's going to be very interesting to sort of see, they have Ecker scores and then they have a point system. And we have, a ba we should be done with data collection, you know, the data collection spirits are with me um, in about two weeks. And then we're also doing uh, a, um, a validation study through Acelero Learning, which has Head Start, Early Head Start, and um, pre-K programs in three states. And the amazing thing about doing with Acelero is all of their staff have work-related e work emails. So we were able to send it out of our Survey Monkey. And you know, North Carolina, we've been going center to center. It's been like, you know, just really a heavy lift. And so uh, that's actually, I mean, I, on the child care side, most child care programs don't have that, but on the Head Start and Pre-K side, that's more and more becoming something that, you know, that we can do. Um, and so what are we going to do with this when it's done? Well, you know, our hope, obviously, is that it will be a research tool that people can use in their studies so that to get a little bit of the contextual information that we've been talking about for the last two days. Um, so stay tuned. I, I don't, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, but we also see it as an educational tool and as a technical assistance tool. And we actually will be working with one of our counties that's working on our QRIS, and we've been talking to a couple other groups and states about how we use it as a, an educational tool and a technical assistance tool. And in terms of education, um, I think one state actually is interested in us do, working with the, the faculty who do, uh, do the director credential in their state so that we, we actually have directors starting to think about these issues when they're thinking about their programs. And again, we also ho will hope that people will use it with teachers too so that we start to have a language. I mean, I think one of the great contributions of classes it gave us a way of sort of to look at teaching and talk about it. And I'm, you know, I'm not, I, I, I say this 
humbly, I don't think, you know, it'll change the conversation in the way the class has, but the idea that we could start talking about teaching supports and learning communities and job crafting and adult well-being and these things, I think will actually help the field think about quality improvement. And then using it as a technical assistance tool with QRIS or mentoring and coaching programs and We'll be working in Santa Clara County with their coaches who are working with their some of their programs going through QRIS to sort of see how people can use it as a readiness tool. So when you have programs that, you know, you really to see what's going on in the program that you maybe need to address before you jump into um, maybe even ratings, but maybe even, um, you know, trying to, do, to design your coaching. And then finally, because um, I know that. I have one minute, or I've overdone my last sentence. Okay, um, no time. Okay, so uh, I, as some of you may know, that uh, Dan Bellum and I wrote a book on mentoring a number of years ago, and it went to the AFT when the Center for the Child Care Workforce went to the AFT. They came back to us and said, "We're getting a demand for this. Can you revise it?" We went and we had to actually rewrite the whole thing because mentoring which had it, there was a heyday of mentoring in the 90s. It's changed so much since then. So that will be out this summer. So, and it has a whole section on how coaches can use the sequel concepts in their work. Okay, thanks. <laughs>